Imagine a human species standing only four feet tall, surviving in isolation on a remote island for thousands of years. Meet Homo luzonensis, an ancient human relative discovered on the island of Luzon in the Philippines. Their ancestors would have made an extraordinary journey, crossing over miles of open sea to reach this island. How did they get there? And what does their existence tell us about the incredible diversity of early humans? Join me as we uncover the mysteries of this unique species. Homo luzonensis is an extinct species of archaic human from the late Pleistocene that lived in Luzon, Philippines, going extinct only around 50,000 years ago. The size of the remains suggests that the humans to whom they once belonged were tiny in stature, with scientists estimating a size of just 4 feet or 1.2 meters, with males being slightly larger than the females. The presence of Homo luzonensis could mean that primitive human relatives left Africa and made it to Southeast Asia, something not previously thought possible. The subsequent study shows that human evolution in the region could well have been a highly complex affair. It's possible that Homo luzonensis's ancestors may have interacted or bred with other hominin species that lived in Asia at the time, such as the enigmatic Denisovans. The first fossil of Luzonensis was a foot bone discovered in Callow Cave in the northwest of Luzon by zoo archaeologist Philip Piper. Three years later, in 2010, French bioanthropologist Florent Détroit, together with a team of international and local Philippine archaeologists, originally identified it as belonging to modern humans. It wasn't until the discovery of 12 new specimens and based on the apparent presence of both modern human-like and the more primitive Australopithecus-like features who were terrestrial bipedal ape-like animals from Africa who lived between about 4.4 to 2 million years ago, they reassigned the remains to a new species, Homo luzonensis, the specific name deriving from the name of the island. The remains retrieved from Callow Cave consist of 13 separate specimens teeth, hand and foot bones, and part of a femur that belonged to at least three adult and juvenile individuals. And what was established was the teeth of Luzonensis were very small, and like other recent homo and modern humans, the molars decrease in size towards the back of the mouth like ours, though bizarrely the three premolars are oddly large compared to the molars, with more similar proportions to the ancient Paranthropus than any other homo and its enamel dentin juncture lacks well-defined wavy crenulations. This is largely where the likenesses end. The finger bones found are long, narrow and curved, and are dorsopalmally compressed, and have strong, well-developed hand muscles, which is seen in early hominins such as Australopithecus and Homo habilis, which, although still a subject of debate, may indicate it spent time climbing in trees, maybe to gather food or as protection from predators or even as an evolutionary readaptation due to the island's limited food resources. The femur excavated is believed to have belonged to a child, but it is only in part, and there is not enough detail to draw any definitive conclusions about its characteristics. The foot fossils, including a third metatarsal bone, displays an unusual curvature that we have not seen since the Australopithecines. Another indicator that climbing was still maybe an important activity for this species. The features of the remains show an intriguing mix of both modern and ancient aspects. While the teeth look more like those of modern humans, the hands and feet seem to match more closely with the Australopithecines, who last walked the Earth some two million years ago in Africa. No other known species shares the whole set of features found at Callo. About 90% of the bone fragments from Kalau Cave belong to the Philippine deer, which suggests that deer carcasses were periodically brought into the cave by Luzonensis. With the exception of Palawan, 1,200 miles away from Luzon, where there were tigers, there is no evidence of large carnivores ever inhabiting the Philippines during the Pleistocene, which attributes these remains to human activity. The Philippine warty pig and an extinct bovid were also present. There are cut marks on a deer tibia, and a lack of tools in the cave could either have resulted from the use of organic material for tools rather than stone, or the processing of meat away from the cave. This game hunting suggests the tiny hobbits were adept hunters, 
not bad for a species standing only four feet, weighing probably no more than 50 pounds. The evidence for life on Luzon and surrounding islands goes back a long way. Some hominins were making stone tools on the island of Flores, which is around 2,000 miles south of Luzon, more than a million years ago, and the oldest hominin fossil on that island is around 700,000 years old. Last year, paleoarchaeologist Thomas Ingico, from the National Museum of Natural History in Paris, and colleagues reported on work at the Rizal archaeological site, situated in Rizal, Kalinga, Philippines, and within an area that has been subject to archaeological explorations since the 1950s, yielded an almost complete skeleton of a rhino, the extinct Nesorinus philippinensis, which had been butchered by early hominins some 709,000 years ago. Together with the rhinoceros skeleton, six lithic cores, 49 lithic flakes, and two hammer stones were found at the Rizal site. Also present were the remains of the elephant relative Stegodon, the Philippine deer, freshwater turtles, and monitor lizards. Very early forms of Homo must have surpassed barriers and found new ways of life in places with very different climates and plant and animal communities than their African ancestors. It is still too early to determine whether the earliest inhabitants of Flores and Luzon directly gave rise to Homo floresiensis and Homo luzonensis. The exact taxonomic classification of Homo luzonensis remains uncertain, and similar to other tropical hominins, attempts to extract DNA have been unsuccessful. However, based on the fossil evidence found on these islands, it appears that Homo luzonensis may resemble an Australopithecus or Homo habilis type hominin, or potentially an ancient Homo species yet to be discovered, which does explain it still having very primitive features, unlike later hominins who were around at the same time. Traditionally, Homo erectus has long been held as the first member of modern humans' direct lineage to leave Africa around 1.9 million years ago. However, the existence of Homo luzonensis suggests that migration may have occurred even earlier, potentially over 2 million years ago. Some researchers still consider Homo erectus to be the ancestor of Homo luzonensis, proposing that this species underwent isolation and island dwarfism over an extended period. Nonetheless, like many aspects of human anthropology, the question of Homo luzonensis's ancestry lacks a definitive answer. Continued research and exploration is what we need to get there someday. The two islands I have talked about, Luzon and Flores, also share a peculiar geography. Land bridges never connected these islands to the Asian continent. Another large disconnected island in the region is Sulawesi, there, stone tools from a site called Talapu were made by hominins more than 118,000 years ago, though no fossils have been found yet to indicate who was making them. Some anthropologists have thought that the colonization of such islands over water was due to luck. Maybe ancient storms or tsunamis washed a few unsuspecting survivors onto ancient beaches, which is the leading theory of how monkeys made it to South America by rafting across the Atlantic Ocean on mats of vegetation and dirt between 40 and 32 million years ago. This was an accidental event that relied on luck and the fact that the world was different at the time. But where one strange event might be attributed to luck, three are much more interesting. Since Luzon has always been an island, the ancestors of Homo luzonensis would have needed to make a significant sea crossing over the Huxley Line this journey took place during the Pleistocene era, when sea levels were up to 390 feet lower than today. Although lower sea levels shortened the distance between the ancient landmass of Sunderland and Luzon, the crossing would still have been substantial and a formidable challenge, requiring considerable effort and ingenuity for early humans. How they got there will likely always be a mystery, but it must have been intentional they may have lashed bamboo or other organic material together to create a watercraft. Unfortunately, organic material does not fossilize, so we will never get to see these ancient boats. This raises an intriguing question. For Homo luzonensis to have successfully completed such a substantial sea crossing, were they capable of complex communication, possibly even speech? Organizing a journey of this scale, 
especially with enough individuals to maintain the genetic diversity necessary for their population to survive for thousands of years, likely required significant coordination. It's hard to imagine this feat being accomplished without some form of sophisticated communication. The ability to plan, cooperate and navigate a sea voyage would suggest that they had the cognitive and social abilities necessary for such an organized effort, making it difficult to rule out the presence of speech or advanced forms of communication. I think this solidifies the case that ancient human relatives were a lot smarter and more adaptable than we used to give them credit for. The island of Luzon would have been quite different from today, shaped by the environmental conditions of the late Pleistocene epoch. Luzon likely had a tropical climate, but cooler and drier compared to today due to the glacial cycles of the Pleistocene. The island would have been covered with dense forests, particularly tropical rainforests, and possibly some open woodland or grassland in the drier areas. These forests would have provided resources like fruits, nuts and plants, Luzonensis may have been climbing trees to reach some of these fruits. As mentioned briefly earlier, Luzon would have been home to a unique array of animals, many of which are now extinct. Large mammals like the Philippine brown deer, various species of pigs, lizards, and potentially even elephant like stegodons or other large herbivores could have roamed the island. Luzon would have been volcanically active as it is today. The island has several volcanoes, and this geological activity would have influenced the landscape with eruptions, lava flows and ash deposits. Rivers and lakes, fed by the island's mountain ranges, would have provided fresh water and supported diverse ecosystems. In summary, Luzon during the time of Luzonensis was a cooler, forested island with diverse wildlife, including some now extinct large mammals. Homo Luzonensis would have thrived in this environment, relying on a mix of hunting, foraging, and possibly some arboreal activity to survive. The reasons why Homo luzonensis went extinct are not fully known, but Homo luzonensis is one of several early human species that went extinct during the period when modern humans were starting to flourish around the world. Neanderthals, Denisovans, Homo floresiensis, and possibly Homo erectus also seem to have become physically extinct as modern humans were spreading and growing in number. Homo sapiens fossils dating to 47,000 years ago, close to the extinction of Luzonensis, have been discovered in the Tabon Caves in Lipun Point in Quezon, Palawan in the Philippines. So it is a possibility that the extinction of Homo luzonensis and the emergence of Homo sapiens are connected in some way. As we've seen, Homo luzonensis offers us a fascinating glimpse into the diversity of ancient human species. From their unique anatomy to their possible sea crossings and mysterious origins, this tiny hominin has raised more questions than answers so far. The discovery of Homo luzonensis reminds us just how much of our ancient past is still a mystery. With so much left to uncover, who knows what other ancient species are waiting to be found. John Hawkes from sapiens.org puts it wonderfully. He wrote, To answer such questions we must reinvest in exploration. The new discoveries of the past decade or so have transformed the field of human origins. New methods of exploration and more intensive exploration of underrepresented regions have introduced a new paradigm. Ancient groups of human relatives were varied and adaptable. They sometimes mixed with one another and that mixing gave rise to new evolutionary solutions. Our species today is the lone survivor of this complicated history. We have replaced or absorbed every other branch of our family tree. Many more of these branches are surely waiting for us to find them. <laughs>